Raise your hand if you get your hair cut at a barber shop. Now keep your hand up if you got your hair cut at a barber shop in the last year. Last month? Last week? Every week? Gotcha. I get my hair cut at the barber shop every week. Why? There's an allure to the barber shop. Fresh cut, feel brand new every day, every week. The people are diverse, age seven to 97, some younger, some older. Different backgrounds, different ways of thinking. Then there's the conversation. <laughs> you know, you've seen the movie. Perspectives on manhood, fatherhood, lifestyle, culture, community. One of the themes of TED for today. And the barbershop has a tradition and heritage of being an institution for learning. Cultural learning, case in point. When I was seven, I learned about racism at the barbershop. Not through a racially charged experience, but through a conversation that my father, who was in the chair, was having with the barber at a place called Headhunters. Now, these two were having a spirited debate about an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> Some of you may have seen it. Kirk and his crew have picked up two passengers. Their faces are painted. One's painted black on one side, white on the other. The other character, black on one side, white on the other. But they were inverted. They were different. And because of this difference, they hated each other. Now, I won't tell you the whole episode. It's called Let This Be Your Last Battlefield. You should check it out. Now, in the 60s and 70s, like this was a very poignant time where racism was very overt. And I think it was Roddenberry's time to really put that out there. But my father and the barber, their conversation had to do with the fact that which one of these characters was right. Turns out one of them was arguing that the one with the black face on the left and the white face on the right was, was right. If you were on the right, you was all right. Now, as a seven-year-old, this was profound in terms of developing my understanding about racism because what I came to understand was people hated each other simply for being different, the color of their skin. This cultural clue that I picked up at the barbershop at that time is something I like to call barbershop knowledge. Now, barbershop knowledge is important. Why? Because it can be spent as currency. Let that marinate for a minute. Barbershop knowledge is something that can be used to sustain your local community in the barbershop, and it ripples out. And the way that this happens is by you spending your knowledge as currency, which increases the intellectual, spiritual, and emotional well-being of the people who receive that barbershop knowledge. Now, that's just the local aspect. Barbershop knowledge also has global implications, case in point. Ever since about 1999, whenever I travel, I don't go anywhere without being aware of one to two, maybe even three or four barbershops to go to. That's crazy, right? But I also get my hair cut every week. Now, when I'm going to a place, my idea is to hit the barbershop because that is the place where I can experience other people's ways of thinking, their perspectives on living, and their culture, and the barbershop is niche enough where I can get different perspectives, even in the same town. That's fantastic. This initially came out when I was taking a trip in 96 across the country, a solo mission from Seattle to North Carolina, and I'm driving along, and I'm going through Salina, Kansas, eight foot tall stalks of corn on either side. I stop at a house, I thought it was a house, it was really a gas station, but was it a diner? It was both, but no, there was also a barbershop there. It was run by a little old woman who was very much opposite of me. I'm big, she's small, I'm black, she's white. I'm young, she's old. She had curly white hair and big glasses like Mr. Magoo, very endearing. We got to talking about my trip. We talked about the barbershop, the diner, and the fact that this little old woman ran the whole hustle. We got to talking about Salina, Kansas, and she's telling me about so-and-so coming through, this, that, and other. We got on a conversation about Kool-Aid. I love Kool-Aid, I'm from the South. She served me a jar, a mason jar, full of Kool-Aid, and it was probably the best jar of Kool-Aid I ever had in my life. Forget the fact that you are not supposed to drink Kool-Aid. 
I asked her, why does her Kool-Aid taste so good? And she said, because I put molasses in it. Now, I didn't get the measurements or the permutations or the dilutions in terms of understanding that, but I took it back to North Carolina, and in the shop, I distilled this information for the brothers there. They spent at least a month or two in their own labs trying to validate my claim <laughs> that Kool-Aid tastes better with molasses. Now, dig this. Barbershop knowledge gained globally is currency you can spend locally. It's kind of like being a cultural ambassador, right? How does this work? Barbershops exist everywhere. They span socio and economic divides. They exist in the third world. They exist in the first world. And really, it's an institution, an institution for cultural learning. And then you can use that information and spend it locally to increase the spiritual, intellectual, and emotional well-being of the people in your community. Your community starts at the barbershop. It propagates out, and it spreads like wildfire. I know, because I've done experiments. Now, let me leave you with this. There's an allure to the barbershop. That allure is barbershop knowledge. That knowledge is gained through the barbershop experience. And through the barbershop experience, you can help others by increasing their well-being, their intellectual well-being, their emotional well-being, their spiritual well-being, and they're better off for it. So I encourage you to go out and get the barbershop experience, even if you don't go to a barbershop. And remember, spend that knowledge abundantly. Thank you.